good we checked. Good morning. Microphone check. One, two, three. Does that work? OK. Yep. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, folks, as we settle into our seats, can I just encourage you to move to the front and to the center so that we make space for the people coming in a little bit later. Um, for those who are here, thank you so much for being on time. Uh, thank you for coming early to worship uh, together. A very warm welcome to each one of you. Uh, my name is Nehemiah. And I'm one of the elders here at Grace Baptist Church. Uh, it's such a blessing to be able to welcome you this morning. Uh, as we settle into our seats, let's also uh, take time to quieten down as we prepare to worship, as we prepare to worship. Uh, if it's your first time joining us this morning, I want to warmly welcome you here. Uh, if you find, uh, you will find in, your, in the pew in front of you uh, a card that if you scan the QR code, that will take you to a list of links uh, that will be very helpful for you to track along as you worship with us this morning. Uh, on that list of links, you will also find a welcome form that we encourage you to fill up. Uh, if you're sitting next to a newcomer, welcome them, uh, help them scan that, uh, encourage them to fill in the form. Uh, that's, really the best way, uh, that's really the best way that we can uh, love and serve you. Uh, sometime in the week, uh, someone from our, from our welcome team will reach out to you uh, by text or by email. Another thing that would be helpful is if you have young children with you, uh, we do have a nursery available for children from ages zero to three. That's up on level five. Uh, so you can go ahead and bring your children up there. Uh, we also have nursing rooms at the back. So if you just exit and turn left, uh, you'll find the, the nursing room that you can bring uh, your child to, to mind and care for them well. Uh, we also have a children's ministry that for three to 12 year olds. Uh, feel free to use those, uh, feel free to, to send them to, to these ministry classes as well. Um, and finally, please stick around after service to join us on level three uh, for a cup of coffee and tea or tea. We'd love to get to know you a bit better. We're gonna be looking at a couple of announcements before we get started on our service. Uh, two equip announcements. Can I invite uh, Pastor Jeremy and uh, Brother Nick up to give those announcements back to back? Good morning, church. Have you one ever wondered why do we teach and practice baptism by immersion? Or have you wondered why is baptism a prerequisite for church membership and partaking of the Lord's Supper? So come and ask questions about the ordinances and we will search the scriptures together later at 11 a.m. So hope to see you there. Hi, everyone. A few years ago, my family, uh, we tasted a really sweet and juicy papaya. And so what we did was uh, we, we loved it so much that we took some of the seeds and we planted it outside our house. And now a few years later, uh, that seed has become a tree. Uh, and that tree has been growing steadily uh, and feeding us well. Uh, my guess is if you're a Christian, you want to be a bit like that papaya tree. You want to be growing you want to be thriving, you want to be bearing fruit. Uh, that's the picture that scripture paints for us as well. Christians grow and bear fruit. Uh, well, how does that happen? How do we grow? 
Uh, to answer that question, uh, join us today as uh, we start our, uh, our four-part series, uh, How We Grow. Uh, in our first session today, we'll look at how the simple, ordinary act of gathering is how God brings supernatural growth to His people. Uh, this is a great series to attend if you've uh, been going for the Equip series on what makes a healthy church. Uh, if that series is a bird's eye view of the Christian life in the church, uh, then this series, How We Grow, uh, is very much kind of practical boots on the ground uh, of what we do together as Christians. Uh, so join us at room 301 at 11 a.m. See you guys there. Thanks, brother. So uh, two equipped classes for you to attend, uh, something for everyone. So I encourage you to do that in room 310 and 301. Um, next up, we have a fundraising event by Gladiolus Place on the 28th of April. So that QR code there will take you to a form uh, where you can pre-order breakfast, right? So I just scanned it just now and I saw they have kueh, they have zhang chan mian, they have all that jazz, right? So uh, what would be really helpful for them is if you scan that and order it ahead, uh, you can make payment. All the information that you will need is on that. Uh, that way, you know, that's the best way that they can kind of prepare ahead of time. Uh, but more than that, friends, this, this is a great way for us to reach out to our neighbours at Gladiolus Place uh, as part of the larger effort to, to evangelise to them. Finally, uh, some news to celebrate as a body. A hearty congratulations to Zhang Tian and Sherilyn on their birth of the first, uh, first child, uh, Ethan, on the 28th of March. Uh, we also rejoice with Jeremiah and Tingxi who were married last week. Uh, let's continue to keep both couples in our prayers as we walk with them. Let's quieten our hearts now and prepare our, um, our hearts to worship our God. This morning's call to worship is taken from Psalm 15, verse 1 to 2. Psalm 15, verse 1 to 2. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Let's pray together. Father, you are our holy and righteous God. You are our God who keeps his people. Apart from you, Lord, we are not righteous and there is no truth in our hearts. Yet you have given us your Son to save us. Thank you that we can come this morning as your people, as blameless ones who can dwell in your presence. Lord, help us to turn our eyes to Christ this morning, to see Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. Help us to turn to you and help us to worship you this morning. All this we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let's all rise for a time of worship. Guide me, O oh, thou great Jehovah.
worship, let's praise our God who knows our need of him and gently calls us to himself. Jesus strong.
Later on in the service, we will continue in our sermon series in, in Isaiah, where we will see the redemption of Israel proclaimed in Isaiah 27. It speaks of Leviathan, the serpent being slain. Um, it points to the defeat of God's enemies and Israel's atonement and the return from exile. Listen as our sister Ruth reads for us from Revelation 12, which speaks of Christ's victory over Satan. Our brother Andrew will lead us in the prayer of confession after that. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Have mercy on us, O God, because of your unfailing love. Wash us clean from our guilt, purify us from our sin, for we have rebelled against you Against you alone we have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. To our most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have in vain sought glory for ourselves instead of magnifying your glory in us. We have allowed pride to lure us into thick seeking the accolades and praises from men. In vain we boast in our accomplishments, our wealth, and the gifts that you have bestowed upon us. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not truly loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, for we have failed to love one another. We have so often seen ourselves as more important than others instead of considering others is more important than us. Forgive us, Lord, for our wandering hearts and our tainted offerings. We have ever so often been lured by the things of this world and allow the material things of this world to shape our desires and direct our pursuits. Forgive us for our fickle hearts. You have, through your word, assured us of your love, your protection, your provision, and yet our faith are often shaken by the circumstances of our life and we lost count of the numerous times that we have questioned your love. Yet, Lord, you are ever so patient and merciful with us. 
and always pouring your grace upon us, but we have often taken your patience and mercy for granted. O Lord, we deserve your wrath and not your mercy. There is nothing in us that is deserving of your mercy and grace, and we can only look to your tender mercy and amazing grace. We have no merit of our own, and we can only let the merit of Christ stand for us. We are full of sin, and our heart is totally corrupt. But you, O Lord, are full of grace and love. You have demonstrated your love for us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. O Lord, we confess our sins, our frequent sins, our willful sins, our hidden sins, resting in the confidence that is not our own, but in your promise that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins. So for the sake of Christ, O Lord, please forgive our sins, for it is in his name we pray. Amen. Let's all rise for a song of thanksgiving. How good it is that we can rely on Christ's work instead of our own. Not what my hands have done.
children, thank you so much for worshipping with us this morning. You can head out to the foyer to meet your teachers. Now, as the children make their way out, let's continue our time of worship um, with tithes and offerings. Um, if you are a newcomer, please do not feel obliged to give, uh, but do consider how you can carefully and um, faithfully take part in the work of the gospel here at GBC. Let's all rise and sing the doxology. Let's go to God now in prayer together. Our Father, after lifting our praises to you and thinking about our thanksgiving that we have for the forgiveness of sins that is ours in Christ, it's such a joy to be able to come to your throne of grace and just bring the requests that are on our hearts. We want to pray this morning for those that are anxious for those that are struggling to entrust to you the burdens of their hearts. I want to pray and ask that by your Spirit, you would help calm them this morning, that even just in this act of gathering with your people and fixing our attention on you, that we'd be reminded of eternal things, that we'd be able to rest. Uh, even those that are in very difficult places right now, those struggling with employment, those wondering about the timing of your provision. God, I pray that you would give them a supernatural peace and rest, that you would even give them a rich testimony to family and friends around them, that in spite of what they're struggling with, that they trust you. 
I pray similarly, Lord, for those struggling with medical needs, with health problems. God, I pray that we would both be people of prayer that would ask you to heal us, as well as entrust to you our bodies and, and know that in the last day, all will be well, including our bodies at the resurrection of the dead. Uh, we pray for faith this morning for those who are struggling with faith, and we pray that you would give us the kind of relationships with each other in this body that would be truly encouraging. God, we want to pray specifically for some needs. We pray for Alan Quay. Thank you for his years of membership with us, for the way he has been so encouraging to so many. We pray for him as he moves back to the U.S., that you would provide for him a healthy church, a church that would feed him and nourish his faith in Seattle where he's moving. God, I pray that you would surprise him with uh, people who reach out to him right away and encourage him, help form the community that he needs there, but please bless him as he moves. We do pray for Zhang Jie and Sherilyn, um, so grateful for the birth of their first child. We pray for Ethan, that he would be healthy and grow. I pray that he would understand the gospel from an early age. Pray that the witness of his parents would be consistent to him, that as he grows and looks at his parents, that he would see humble sinners who trust a great Savior. We pray as well for Jeremiah and Ting Shi as they have wed even just a week ago. We pray that their marriage would point to the gospel as they lay down their lives for each other as they make compromises to serve each other in love and place the needs of the other ahead of their own. We do pray that as a body, we would be a great encouragement to them in their marriage. Even outside of our own body this morning, Lord, we pray for other churches in Singapore. We're grateful for Capo Road Baptist Church, for the years of friendship between our two churches. We pray for Pastors David and Anson Arthur, that you would anoint them to preach your word faithfully. We pray that you would build up that congregation. We pray as they're in the midst of revising their constitution that you would give great unity to them as they discuss what is best for the church going forward. We do pray that you would help them to raise up more leaders, that there would be a younger generation coming up, walking faithfully with you. God, would you give that church many, many more years of faithful gospel ministry. We pray the same thing for Neighborhood Baptist Church. We're grateful for Yanadi being able to preach there yesterday. We pray for fruit from the preaching of the word. We pray that you would add to the number at that church those who are being saved. And we pray that there would be even increased cooperation between our churches in the years to come. Lord, outside of Singapore, we pray for peace as we have done many times, even as things in the Middle East seem to be escalating. We pray for peace between Iran and Israel, other nations in that area. We pray for peace so that the gospel could spread and so that faithful churches would be able to do evangelism. We pray for freedom to worship according to conscience. We pray that in these difficult times, you would cause believers to put their hope in you and we pray that you would meet their needs. Finally, Lord, we pray for our own hearts as we come to the word this morning. We, we ask for softness. We pray for freedom from distraction. We pray that you would help us to see what we need from your word so that we could feed on it and be strengthened and grow. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Confidence is essential to perseverance. I see this regularly watching youth soccer games. A game will begin and it will be tightly contested. Two teams going at it with all of their energy and strength. And then at some point a goal will be scored and perhaps a second one. And you will watch the losing team's shoulders begin to slump. You will watch the kids begin to argue with each other and to lose confidence that they can win the game. And then, depending upon the team and what happens next, 
two nil becomes three nil becomes many nil. Because confidence is essential to perseverance. I saw this with my wife when she was in her marathon running days. My job as a coach was to jump onto the course at the 30 kilometer mark and to encourage her to keep going. It's a strange time to interact with marathon runners because they begin to lose their minds. I remember seeing one gentleman who was close to cursing the day of his birth. He was speaking to himself. There was no one around. He said, what am I doing? And he just walked off the course. Saw a wife trying to coax her husband into keep running. And even my own dear wife at one point begins to walk and then begins at an angle to head over to the side to a grassy area. I said, what are you doing? She said, I just thought I would stop and walk over here. I said, the, the, the finish line is right up there, which, depending upon your viewpoint, was either a lie or just strategic hyperbole. <laughs> Confidence is essential to perseverance. In our spiritual lives, this struggle with doubt is an ever-present reality for us. It's built into the times in which we live when the Lord has designed us to walk by faith and not by sight. And it's difficult for us in part because the world in which we live doesn't think that way. I was thinking about the, the Chinese phrase, 时间,时间年真理,唯一标准. Practice is the sole criterion for judging truth. There's a phrase popularized by Deng Xiaoping, and it captures the spirit of our materialistic age. We believe that all true things can be tested now. They can be confirmed now. They can be handled and verified. And in a world that favors such things, the believer in God is swimming against the current. Now, God knows our struggle. That, that's why the Bible is filled with assurances meant to strengthen our faith. It's filled with persuasion designed to convince us that God's promises about the future are trustworthy because He knows that our confidence is essential to perseverance. We've been studying what is known as the Apocalypse of Isaiah, four chapters, 24 to 27, that take up a view of the end times. We use the word eschatology. It just means study of the end in Greek. The prophet has zoomed out from Israel and Judah to the surrounding nations and then the whole world as we've been walking through the book, and, and he's been viewing them from the standpoint in these chapters of all of human history. So from his vantage point, he, he looks past the events of his day as Israel has declined morally, spiritually, as they're heading towards exile, to see a day beyond when God's people will be restored, when their enemies will be judged, and all things will be made right. And we said last week that these are important issues for us because what we need in this life is an unwavering trust in eternal realities. We need to fix in view what the end looks like and then work backwards as we live this life if we're going to grow in faith in all kinds of ways. Well, as we pick up the last chapter in this mini section this morning, we're continue to look towards the last times, the end times. We're given a series of images that are meant to cover over our doubts with confidence in the Lord, confidence that he'll do all that he says, he'll fulfill all his promises, accomplish all of his purposes, confidence that will give us perseverance. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 27. It's in 
Uh, Your pew Bible's on page 550 if you want to turn there or in your copy of God's Word. And I want to build our outline around four confidence-building promises. Four confidence-building promises. You may want to write these down so you can think about them, talk about them later. Number one, God will defeat our greatest enemy. God will defeat our greatest enemy. Number two, God will meet our every need. God will meet our every need. Number three, God will discipline our wayward hearts. God will discipline our wayward hearts. And then fourth and finally, God will gather us at the end. God will gather us at the end. It's my prayer that our study will increase your confidence in God and give you the perseverance you need even just this next coming week. So let's think first about how God will defeat our greatest enemy. We're looking at Isaiah 27 and verse 1. In that day the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, And he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now, our chapter is going to be filled with these in that day statements. Uh, This follows on from a number of images in the chapters we were considering the last several weeks that point to the last days. So we thought about the resurrection of the dead and the feast of heaven, the final judgment. The Lord is pictured here as doing battle with Leviathan. And it's interesting that the prophet is using mythological language that would have been familiar to his first hearers. So Leviathan was an ancient symbol of evil in its monstrous horror. Apocalyptic literature often uses this kind of symbolism to point to the battle between good and evil. So Leviathan can point generally to great power that opposes God. But there's little doubt that what's in view here is ultimately the conflict between God and Satan, the mighty fallen angel who's at war with God's people. Ruth read to us earlier from Revelation 12, it's worth thinking about why Satan is consistently referred to with snake or or serpentine or dragon language. Why, Why would that be the case? I mean, He's the snake in the beginning of the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, that deceives Adam and Eve. He's Leviathan here, Revelation 12. He's that great red dragon who makes war against the people of God. I think there are three reasons we can infer why Satan is so regularly described as a dragon or a snake. First is because he's devious. He's called a twisting serpent here. He's crafty. He's aiming to deceive. He's often called the father of lies, which he is, but his lies are camouflaged with the veneer of truth. God wants you to be happy, so you should always follow your heart. True and then false. You've failed him so many times. How could you expect God to continue to love you? True, we've failed him many times, but not true at all. We have every reason to think that he loves us. Marriage is supposed to be a blessing, and I'm miserable right now. I should get out. Well, marriage is supposed to be a blessing. And you may feel miserable right now, but that's completely false. This is the way that Satan lies to us. He's devious. But he's not just devious, he's also deadly. I mean, the image of a dragon is not accidental. A monstrous being, the ancient symbol, is the kind of creature that human beings are no match for. Adam and Eve are immediately undone by Satan's lies. He's called by Paul in the New Testament the God of this age who has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, 
who is the image of God. God alone must intervene if that blindness is to be taken away and we can see who Christ is. He's deadly. He's not just devious and deadly. We also can think of how the serpent imagery points to the fact that he is a coward. He is the fleeing serpent here. He attacks God's people because he cannot attack God himself. He thought he could tempt the Son of God not to go to the cross. Perhaps thought at the death of the Son of God he might reign in the hour of darkness. But he was undone at the resurrection of the dead. And he's merely a condemned criminal awaiting judgment. Revelation 20 and verse 10 points to exactly where he is heading. And the devil who had deceived the saints was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what uh, Martin Luther was reflecting on when he wrote stanza three of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He wrote, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. One little word will fell him. That's meant as a great comfort for the people of God. No matter what you feel like assails you right now, no matter what attacks you are experiencing, whatever doubts and insecurities, whatever fears and anxieties, God stands with a drawn sword over against your greatest enemy. He has defeated him, and he will defeat him. God will defeat our greatest enemy. Let's think secondly about the fact that God will meet our every need and keep reading in verses 2 through 5. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march against them. I would burn them up together or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. All right, we have our second in that day here. So again, the prophet is pointing towards end times from his perspective. When he says a pleasant vineyard, sing of it, we should immediately think of Isaiah 5. That's the first time there was a song about a vineyard. In Isaiah, remember there, it was a song about all that God had done for Israel. He had chosen a fertile hill. He had cleared it of stones. He had built a watchtower and a wine vat. He had put up a hedge of protection. He had planted these choice vines and then waited for Israel to bear fruit. But what we read there was that it did not bear fruit good fruit, it bore stink fruit. I think wild grapes was the English translation, but stink fruit is the, the more accurate way to describe it. And because of the wickedness of Israel, he was going to send them into exile. That's what we thought about there. But the judgment of God on his people raises a question. How does God now feel about them? Is he still committed to them? What we're given here is a picture of God as the gardener or, or the vine keeper, since this is a vineyard. And we're told that he will always do two things for the vineyard. Can you see it there? First, it says every moment he will water it. So God will nourish his people with all that is necessary for life and growth, every moment. And then secondly, lest anyone punish it, I keep it night and day. To keep means to protect. There are marauders that could try to break in and steal grapes or destroy the vines. With vineyards, this could be the four-footed variety or the two-footed variety. Well, God describes himself as the defender of his people. 
So God says he will protect and provide for his people. He will meet their every need for life and preservation. But he even goes further here in verse 4. He says, I have no wrath. This is a major interpretive decision that we have to make because I have no wrath could be connected to what has come before. So his commitment to protect and provide is because he no longer has any wrath towards them. If so, this is probably pointing to the new covenant, the age of the gospel that we live in. Because of the death of Jesus, God's wrath against sin is propitiated, it's satisfied. He no longer has any wrath towards the believer. Or, I have no wrath, could go with the next phrase that follows. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march out against them. I would burn them up together. So, some think that this is all pointing to a day when there are no longer any enemies of God's people for him to fight against. So God, God is like a husband that, that wants someone to mess with his bride so he can prove his zealousness for her. But there are no longer any enemies to fight. Well, if, if that's correct, then it could be pointing to heaven itself when all the enemies are gone and defeated. I take it to be the former. So this is pointing to the age in which we're living right now. I do so mainly because of verse 5 there. Or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. So, so these enemies of God's people who are like thorns and briars, human opponents trying to infest the vineyard, God is confronting them saying, instead of opposing my people, why not join my people? Why not lay hold of my protection in the gospel and be at peace with me? So I think this pleasant vineyard is all a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. God sustains us with the water of life every moment, provides spiritual nourishment for us. He protects us from enemies by watching over us constantly and by building his church. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against. He has no wrath because as Romans 3 says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, of propitiation the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Brothers and sisters, think about all the ways that God has been good to you this morning. It, it's a long list. Think of the spiritual blessings that are yours in Christ. Forgiveness, adoption, reconciliation with him. Think about all that he does to feed you with his word through the the church, and the encouragement of the Spirit. Why has He been so good to you? There isn't anything in you or I that, that deserves His love. We aren't lovely that He should love us. And yet He's been so very good. Consistent provision and protection and no longer any wrath. Friend, even if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you're, you're not a Christian, First of all, we're so glad that you were willing to come. You know, we don't have a marketing department here, but we'd like to spread the word that this is an open service. We'd like more people to know they can come and find out more about what the Bible teaches here. We mean it to be that way. But I don't want you to miss verse 5 as God's speaking to you this morning. When he says, or... Let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. He says that because he sent his son to die for the sins of anybody who will turn from their sins and trust in him. It's an open invitation. It's a free gift. You know, in this world, everything that seems too good to be true is too good to be true, except this. You say, well, what's the catch? Well, you've got to turn from your self-rule and your sin, which hasn't done any good for you anyway, and you've got to make Jesus your Lord 
And what does he intend to do? Well, he intends to protect and provide for you and love you to eternity. This is the only thing. It, it, it would be too good to be true if it weren't true. What keeps you from turning from your sin and making peace with him this morning? I'll be standing at that door right at the end of the service. I'd love to talk with you about that. Maybe you could come tell me what's keeping you from making peace with God this morning. The second thing we see here, God will defeat our greatest enemy. He will meet our every need. Let's consider a third promise. God will discipline our wayward hearts. Pick it up in verses 6 through 11. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Has he struck them as he struck those who struck them? Or have they been slain as their slayers were slain? Measure by measure, by exile, you contended with them. He removed them from his, with his fierce breath in the day of the east wind. Therefore, by this, the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for, and this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones crushed to pieces, no asherim or incense altars will remain standing. For the fortified city is solitary, a habitation deserted and forsaken, like the wilderness. There the calf grazes, there it lies down and strips its branches. When its boughs are dry, they are broken. Women come and make a fire of them. For this is a people without discernment. Therefore, he who made them will not have compassion on them. He who formed them will show them no favor. All right, in days to come, this is our third time marker, introduces our third section. It is in some ways a continuation of God's dealings with his people. We, we just thought about the fact that he loves them. He meets their needs. Even the exile did not signal a change of his affection. God still loves his people. But we might still wonder whether he can use them. I mean, does the failure of God's people ruin their fruitfulness? And their usefulness. So think about your own failure as a believer for a moment. You haven't been as faithful to the Lord as you could have been. I mean, all of us have been believers from different lengths of times, but all of us can look back and, and think with regret about ways in which we haven't sought Him earnestly. We haven't been zealous in fighting against our sin. We could have been more faithful church members, more faithful evangelists. So we praise God for the good news that we're forgiven and we're still loved by God, but, but we can easily lose confidence in the idea that God can really use broken vessels like us. Likewise, we can easily lose confidence that He can really change us. Well, look at Israel here. We're told that in days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. You may remember the image of a stump. Israel's like a tree that was cut down in the exile, but the, the root is still there, so shoots can still come out of the tree. But we might wonder, is this going to be a, a really sad-looking tree, just a stump with a little shoot coming out of it? What kind of a tree is it going to be? Well, we're told here that it's a massive tree. Look at the image. It, it's filling the whole world with fruit. So apparently God can still use His wayward people. But how does this happen? Verse 7, as he struck them, as he struck those who struck them, have they been slain as their slayers were slain? We're being asked here to do a comparison between how God judges his people and how he judges unbelievers, Israel versus Assyria, or Israel versus Babylon. With Israel, we, we're told in verse 8, measure by measure, by exile, you contended with them. He removed them with his fierce breath in the day of the east wind. The, the east wind was hot wind that would blow in off the desert. 
in the east of Israel. It would destroy their crops. It was a picture of judgment. But this verse means that God chastised or disciplined Israel in a measured sort of way. Uh, We can picture a, a good parent with a young child who has disobeyed considering what, what is the best way to make the punishment fit the crime. And, and parents, we need to be careful, right? We need to work hard not to discipline our children in anger, not to forget about the fact that our goal is always their good, their reformation, teaching them the difference between right and wrong. Well, God never loses control. That's what measure by measure means. He brings the discipline that's needed. I like what commentator Matthew Henry writes here. God will deal out afflictions as the wise physician prescribes medicines to his patients. Just such a quantity of each ingredient. Thus God orders the troubles of his people, not suffering them to be tempted above what they are able quoting from 1 Corinthians 10, 13 there. Friends, I wonder if you trust the Lord's discipline in your life. Do you trust Him to to measure out the medicine to you, the medicine that you need? You know, we don't need to be able to connect our hardships to something specific that we've done wrong. I'm not saying that we're able to do that. Hebrews 12, 7 tells us to endure all hardship as discipline. God is treating us as children, he writes. For what children are not disciplined by their father? So when hardship comes, we're supposed to see it as allowed into our lives by the hand of a good father to discipline our wayward hearts towards him. Are we prone to wander? Yes. Do we need discipline? Yes. He provides it for us. But how should we respond to his discipline? That's verse 9. Look there. Therefore, by this, the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for, and this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones crushed to pieces, no ashram, no incense altars will remain standing. The sin in view here is idolatry. So Israel worshipped the gods of the nations, the, the, the gods that were supposed to bring wealth or they were supposed to bring fertility or, or victory in battle. Their guilt, therefore, was the breaking of the first table of the Ten Commandments not to have any gods before him, not to make for themselves graven images or bow down and worship them. And we're told here that when they grind down the stones of these idolatrous altars and crush them to pieces, that that will be the the full fruit of the removal of their sin, the full forsaking of their idols, is the sign of forgiveness or atonement. So to say it briefly, without repentance, we should expect no pardon from the Lord. Our hearts must truly want to get rid of sin. And this inward feeling of our hearts should take outward manifestation in a change of life. That's what repentance means powderizing our idols, crushing them to pieces. So let's take the person struggling with sexual sin. They're viewing things that they shouldn't view on on apps and websites, movies. And you talk to them about getting some accountability software and and deleting media accounts and, and getting rid of streaming services. They tell you that they don't think that that's actually necessary. Uh, They have an alternate, less drastic approach that they want to take. But the problem continues. Well, Well, the problem is that's not what repentance looks like. Or the person that isn't growing spiritually, but they also have no spiritual disciplines in their life. They're not reading the Scripture regularly. 
They're not praying about what's going on in their life. They're irregular at church. So you talk to them about developing some spiritual disciplines, but it's hard, right? Because binge-watching their favorite dramas and and making it to the next level of the, the video game that they're playing or revenge bedtime procrastination, keeping up with all their social media accounts doesn't really allow for that. I mean, can you suggest a different way for me to end up at the same result? Well, no. We respond to God's discipline with idol-crushing repentance. That's the message here. Megan and I like to come back to the way we, we trained our kids to obey when they were young. We, we, we made them memorize a, a phrase, uh, what is obedience? Right away, all the way, with a good attitude. I can hear them singing it now. But Megan and I have often reflected how useful it would be in our own spiritual lives if we would respond to the Lord that way. Right away, all the way, with a good attitude. Now, verse 10 and 11 is sobering because it describes the cost of unrepentance. Where the fortified city is solitary. There is a great deal of debate about what is the city in question. Uh, Isaiah does not tell us. A fortified city is now pictured here as deserted, so animals are wandering through the city grazing. Women are walking around and and searching for firewood in it. Uh, Some interpreters think this is Jerusalem after Babylon captures it in 586. So a picture of Israel in its unrepentant state. Others think it's a continuation of the generic fortified city that we've been running to, running into in the past several chapters as a picture of mankind in their proud unrepentance towards God. Either way, this stands as a warning of what happens if we refuse to repent. God says this is a people without discernment. Meaning that they don't see that in rejecting God, they're sealing their own doom. Therefore, he who made them will not have compassion on them. He who formed them will show them no favor. The empty city is a a stark contrast to the tree from verse 6 that fills the whole world with fruit, isn't it? Fruitful tree or empty city. Beloved, let's be a people eager to grow in the ways that the Lord wants us to grow. There are things about this church that that need to change. Certainly there are. But all the most important ones deal with our hearts, our humility, our responsiveness to the Lord. That's all the most important changes that we need to make as a church, that we need to make as individuals, that we would be constantly identifying idols in our lives so that we can turn away from them, we can figure out how to powderize them. It's the key to our ministry faithfulness. You know, one of the best ways you could show your desire to be humble before the Lord is to be humble before brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the best things that you could do for your spiritual growth is find a trusted friend and give them a a permission card to ask any question or to tell you anything they see that seems to be amiss in your life. That may sound scary to you. That is one of the best things you could do. Please tell me. You don't even have to be sure to ask me a question. Hey, I I saw you interacting with that person. That that didn't seem quite right to me. What's going on there? Give people that permission card. They, They probably won't do it if you don't encourage them to. But that kind of humility before brothers and sisters sets us up well to have that same posture towards the Lord. Third promise, God will discipline our wayward hearts. Let's consider fourth and finally, God will gather us at the end. Look at verses 12 and 13. In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain 
and you will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. So our final in that day, we actually have two of them here. These are parallel verses, 12 and 13, describing the same event. And we've got some geography to get straight in our minds. So from the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt and the land of Assyria to the land of Egypt, both describe what happened in the exile. So the Euphrates is where Assyria and later Babylon were. The exile happens in two stages. Uh, My seminary professor said that all Christians should know these two dates. I'm not sure. That might be a bridge too far. But 722 and 586. 722 is the fall of Samaria, the fall of the northern kingdom. And then Judah falls in 586, as Jerusalem does. In both of those events, while some are carried off into exile in the north, Others scatter to the south in Egypt. So the geography is just describing the scattering. But theologically, you realize that many would have assumed that this is the end of God's plans and promises to Israel. I mean, he had promised through Israel to bring blessing to the whole earth. Instead, the descendants of Abraham are, are scattered. They're likely going to be assimilated. Uh, Here and in other prophecies of the return, we're told this is not so. So verse 12, the Lord will thresh out the grain. This is the image of beating wheat. You separate the kernel of grain from the worthless husk. And then we're told you will be gleaned one by one or gathered one by one. So somehow through this disaster... God is going to accomplish a clarifying of who really is a child of God, and then He's going to regather them. Verse 13, it's a parallel repetition and expansion. We're told in that day a great trumpet will be blown, and they will be gathered to come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Now, the question for us is when did this return happen, or when does it happen? It's a key question. Uh, We might answer that it happened partially when after 70 years of exile in Babylon, uh, some of the Israelites returned to the land. We read about that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, last historical books in the Old Testament. But that return falls far short of what is described here. They they do build a second temple. Um, They're soon conquered by the Romans. And then Israel falls into deeper and deeper spiritual compromise. We might answer that it happens more fully with the coming of Christ and His death for sin, the going out and the preaching of the gospel to all nations, the age of the church. But those in Israel who are true believers respond to that preaching, and and the tree of Israel grows to fill the earth as people from Gentile nations like us believe. I don't think either of those are wrong answers. Remember that interpreting prophecy is is a bit like seeing a a mountain range that's in the distance. If you ever have a chance to drive through Kansas, I don't know why you would do that, but you will see the Rocky Mountains rising in the distance from about 100 miles away, and you will assume that you're looking at the front range, a line of mountains there. But closer and closer you get, they start to take on depth, and you realize that many of the mountains you are looking at are dozens of miles beyond. And even sometimes you're looking at one peak, and there's a peak beyond it. It's very much like what interpreting prophecy is. I'm persuaded that the language of verse 13 means that though the return And then the age of the gospel are part of the fulfillment. The meaning is only finally and fully exhausted by the return of Christ and the end of the age. I think that because of this language of the great trumpet that's blown by the chief of angels at the end of time. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of an archangel, 
with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. The trumpet is blown suddenly, without warning. People will be going to work. They will be at work. Some will be eating. Some will be sleeping. All will on some level assume that this day will be like every other day. But it won't be. For the trumpet will not just get the attention of the living. It will sound so loud as to wake up the dead. Have you thought about that? Matthew, the tax collector, he'll rise. Mary Magdalene will rise. Augustine of Hippo with his mother Monica, they will rise. So will Wang Mingdao and Dai De Sheng and Ni Tuo Shen. They will rise. So will many more that are dear to us. Laura Clement and Dorcas Lau and Ernest and Verda Paulson, they will rise. But the great multitude that no one can count that will rise from the dead in response to this trumpet. They're gathered one by one, each and every one, followed by those who are still alive, who are left. The truth is unmistakably that God will gather all his people at the end. None are lost, none are forsaken. They are gathered for worship as we are here, but this is only a dress rehearsal. Uh, there will be no separation. There will be no veil on that day. We, we look in a, a mirror dimly now, but then we will see face to face. Now, how does that affect us when we walk out of here in just a few minutes? What does that have to do with our lives today? We have not heard the trumpet yet. Some of us are young and are students. I hope you put your heart into your studies because the Lord gave you a brain and a life to use as best you could use it. So I hope you Put your energy into studying and preparing for tests that are coming. But I hope you likewise realize that those tests don't define you in any way, shape, and form. I don't know if your parents appreciate me telling you this, but 10 years from now, nobody will care what you got on that test. They won't. It won't even take you that long. Some of us are parents. We ought to remember that our children are not fools. They may be foolish sometimes, but they're not fools. If we tell them that we believe that day, the day of the trumpet, is the most important thing in the world to us, if we give lip service to that, and then we give life service to building a heaven on earth, and making material things our focus, our children will see it. They're not fools. Some of us are immersed in concerns of career. They're necessary concerns. I know that. Employment is a gift to be thankful for and stewarded. But friends, a career is not worth building your life around. Don't take the means and make it the end. Some of us are nearing the end of our earthly pilgrimage. I would imagine for you, you model for us what it looks like just to savor these words, just to enjoy them, to delight in them. None will be lost. All will be gathered. Death is not the end. Worship is the end. And so, after we scatter here, we do it with the expectation that we will gather again. I don't know if it's next Sunday or not. But the writer of the hymn put it this way, we meet to part, part to meet, 
when earthly labors are complete, to join in yet more blessed employ in an eternal world of joy. God will defeat our greatest enemy. He will meet our every need. He will discipline our wayward hearts. And he will gather us at the end. Confidence is necessary for perseverance. Let's pray. Father, you've been so good to us in so many ways. It delights our heart to meditate on these words. We pray that you would give faith, that you would give us a vision of the end that would sustain us through this life. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise for our song of response. Looking forward to eternity. We look forward to the coming day when we will all be gathered here now this benediction from 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it.
Please be seated. Let's take some quiet moments to reflect and respond on what God is saying to us this morning. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. As we look forward to the service next week, I encourage you to read ahead. We'll be looking at Isaiah 29 to 33, uh, 28 to 33, sorry. Uh, it's a long chunk of text, so please read as you come and prepare to, to hear God's word preached. See you downstairs.